Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In the name of the friends of the secession, it is my pleasure to welcome you here. This was a tight race. Between the almost apocalyptic final phase of the renovation of the secession, still ongoing, and the simultaneous installing of a large group show, I admit that I was at times quite skeptical if anything will actually happen. But here we are, thanks to Annette Zutbeck and the incredible dedicated team of the secession who have stoically kept their cool, the secession is shining again, dressed in white and sparkling in gold. Other Mechanisms is the title of the exhibition here at hand. It is conceived by the curator, Anthony Huberman, seated here, who organized it together with Jeanette Bacher from the Secession. Other Mechanism includes works by 23 artists, of which eight are present here tonight. We are honored to welcome Nairi Bagramian, Eva Barto, Patricia Boyd, Nina Cannell and Robin Watkins, Aaron Flint Jameson, Jacob Cassay, and Sam Lewitt. It is my pleasure to introduce Anthony Huberman and his conversation partners for this exhibition talk. Anthony Huberman was born in Geneva and is presently director and chief curator of the CCA Waters Institute in San Francisco. Leading up to this position, he has been curator at prestigious museums in Europe and the United States. He was founding director of the legendary Artists Institute in New York. He has organized so many solo exhibitions by so many artists that the list is simply too long to enumerate here. He is contributor to the most prestigious international art magazines and his catalogs and books are very much sought after. I would like to point out his three most recent publications. Today, we should be thinking about, published by Koenig in 2016, Mechanisms, published by CCA Waters in 2017, and of course, his most recent book, Other Mechanisms, the beautiful exhibition catalog for this show, available as of today in our bookstore. The format of today's talk is loosely following the American example of the CRIT, with representatives from the three teaching institutions in Vienna. To those in art school, CRIT means the most essential and familiar of events, the critique session, in which a student's, or in our case, a curator's propositions is being formally investigated by a group of faculty and colleagues who present and question perhaps even their own assumptions pertaining to the exhibition and works on hand. I'm happy to introduce Noit Banai, Professor for Contemporary Art at Universität Wien. She has kindly agreed to serve as moderator and participant and equally participant for this panel. Sabit Buchmann, is Professor for Art History of Modern and Postmodern Art at the Academy of Fine Arts. And Eva Maria Stadler is Chair of the Department of Art and Society at the Uni University of Applied Art. I thank all of the participants, especially Anthony Huberman, for so generously accepting our invitation. Since we are opening the exhibition proper at 7 p.m., we will not have time to do a Q&A for this panel. You will, however, have the opportunity to ask all the artists present, the curator, and our critics questions during the time of the opening. Thank you very much. We look forward to your panel. Can you hear me, Houston? <laughs> Houston? Okay. Uh, so thank you very much to everyone who came out tonight. 
Uh, thank you very much to the secession, to the friends of the secession, uh, to the Vienna community, to the international community, to everyone who is here today um, in body and in spirit. And without further ado, I want to uh, invite Anthony to make a statement uh, about the exhibition. Uh, and, from, uh, and after his statement, we will uh, begin the uh, questions and answers, the discussion, the uh, analysis, uh, the examinations, uh, not a formal examination in any strict way. But uh, I would first like to invite Anthony to make a presentation of the work, uh, especially as m many of you have not had the chance to do a walkthrough or to see the exhibitions for yourself. So this is a little preview. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, many people to thank in this uh, project. And also, again, to congratulate everyone at the session for a gorgeous, newly renovated building. And it's really a, a, a privilege to be able to be part of the inauguration of, uh, of, of something as special as, as that. Um, I want to thank Sylvie for organizing this panel and all of you um, for joining me up, up here. Um, and trying to start a conversation around, around some of what um, uh, is going on in the room. Uh, I always imagine exhibitions is they begin when they open. Um, so this is the, this, this hopefully we can get, get somewhere over the next couple months. Um, I especially want to thank the, the team here, um, Jeanette and Bettina specifically, and Hans, the technical director, really went far above and beyond the possible to make this happen. So. Thank you, Jeanette. Well done. No, no, no. Um, also, I'll just note that we're missing an artwork. You know, this, this, we're sitting inside of what should be Sturdivant. So we're all, should be Sturdivants up here. Um, yeah, because of this, um, Sylvie's, um, idea, proposition for how to organize this, we chose to really have this be, rather than a, me giving a long talk or doing a walkthrough, going work by work and everything, um, that it would maybe be more productive for me to do something, just really kind of some short introduction of some of the, the departure points for me of what got this going and um, what, uh, uh, yeah, some of the ideas that informed the thinking behind, behind the exhibition. And then um, uh, talk it through. And we have the works here that as they come up in examples, the, th the four of us were able to spend a bunch of time yesterday going around each work, so they are able to also bring up particular works as examples, and we can kind of bring them up on the screen in case um, uh, people haven't seen them. So uh, I guess just to, to give a, a short introduction, um, the show, I guess, in, in, in general terms, is thinking about the tools that we use today, and, and maybe more specifically, a more, a more specific word for tool in this case would be machine. Um, and on one hand, what are they? What do they look like today? What do they do? Um, but maybe more interestingly for me is not just what um, machines do, but also what they do to us. And um, not just machines as um, in terms of tools that allow us to produce things or make things, but tools that also um, enforce a particular value system, enforce a particular ideology. Um, what, one phrase that is often used is this notion that the tool shapes the hand, that the tool is not a, a neutral thing. A, a hammer might be something you can use to hit a nail into some wood, but a hammer also demands that you hold your hand in a particular way in order for that tool to work. So that tool is, is not just an inert object. It has, in that case, very literal physical demands, but some of the things I'm trying to think through are the maybe more ideological demands that, that our tools and machines um, have and ask uh, that we believe in in order to make use of them. Um, but at the same time, you'll notice that the exhibition title is not, there's been a, a, a kind of change of words. It's not machine, but mechanism. Um, and for me, that switch was important or useful 
um, because it allowed me to incorporate the machine and this expanded sense that I'm trying to think about beyond just this notion of it being a, a thing, an object. So the word mechanism for me on one hand can incorporate the notion of a machine, like a mechanical object, a mechanical mechanism. But that same word, I think, is also comes up when you talk about something much more abstract, um, uh, something like an administrative mechanism, a uh, mechanism in the sense of a set of parameters, a set of protocols, a set of standards. Um, a mechanism, a mach again, in other words, machine in more of the infrastructure sense of the word. Um, and, and so I guess that, that transition was important to me, this notion of uh, the way in which today, um, you know, machines, um, you know, work is starting to, to there, there's work and then there's the management uh, of the work. There's the machine and there's the, the, the mechanism. Um, another thing that I, that, that I um, was interested in playing with a little bit um, is I, I presume that most people walking into an exhibition that has the title Other Mechanisms are, are probably going to expect to walk into a show that has a bunch of kinetic sculptures running around everywhere, a bunch of mechanical objects moving and turning. And, and you'll notice um, as you walk through that with one exception, which is the piece, the Sturdivant piece, um, there's no moving objects in, in this show um, the, the, because for me, that was a, an important thing to, to, to reflect on, just in the sense that today machines are, you know, have, have become a little bit harder to, um, to than, than a mechanical object, a bit more complicated in the sense that they don't necessarily come with plugs that you can unplug or on and off buttons that when you're tired uh, of a machine doing its thing, you just simply press off or unplug. Um, as all of you, I'm sure, know, you, you turn your computer off or your phone off and, and very little about it is actually turned off. Um, and so as a way to think about how that maybe, you know, the, the machines um, don't come in that, in that way. They're much harder to stop if you're tired of them and don't want them to do what they're supposed to do. And you, you, so having a bunch of, like, electrical motor things that you just can switch off when you feel like it, you know, was something that I wanted to... Um, avoid specifically in, in a show and to again encourage this try, thinking through this notion of a mechanism in this larger in this in this larger um, this larger way um, let me think if I can use a couple of the works to would that be useful to kind of animate I mean that's kind of a general departure point um, for me um, for, 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 for what led to the show. The works are wide ranging in terms of people coming from different parts of the world, very, very different generations. Um, everything from uh, drawings by Frederick Kiesler from the late 1930s, all the way to work newly made for, for this exhibition. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I guess that's my short little introduction. Or maybe you think that there's a particular work that maybe I can talk through that would help illustrate it a little bit more. Uh, probably we can continue to speak in more yeah. general terms about yeah. the concept of the, your show, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, then to continue with specific works, I mm -hmm. would uh, suggest. Mm -hmm. Probably I uh, would continue, uh, first of all, to the first impression when one enters uh, the space and is confronted with works that reminds us, me, on the legacies or the intersections of the legacies of minimal art on the one hand and of uh, conceptual art, of course, on the other hand. And uh, since Sylvie asked us to put our tools on the table, uh, I quickly would uh, say what is of interest uh, here for me, since I uh, focused in my research on uh, the uh, intersections between uh, conceptual art and uh, new technologies, information mm -hmm. communication technologies, it was for me then striking that um, Saul Lewitt's wall drawings in 1968, that was uh, exactly at the transition of the minimal art legacy towards the conceptual art legacy, that you had a kind of grid structure that turned into a kind of 
more system-based mm -hmm. or network-based structure, and you haven't any longer this idea to depict the machine, like right. in Warhol's work, or when you compare it to a minimalist agenda, it was indexed to the industrial, to the mechanical machine, whereas conceptual art was indexed then to the software, to the information-based machine. And for me, it was very interesting to find out that Saul Lewis's wall drawings very much uh, resembled uh, Alan M. Turing's definition of the computing machine. By not using the machine, it's in a most abstracted way. Mm -hmm. So saying that it was not longer possible to depict or to represent the machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, here my question, in how far this kind of turning point in the way how the machine or the mechanics has been represented in art history or in contemporary art history was of influence for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a long history, you know, not only art historically, but I guess the one that I looked at also was the, the, the exhibition histories, the lineages around how some of this art, artist, art and machine topic got thought about. And I'm curious if maybe others come to mind from, mm -hmm. from yours. Uh, from your perspective. Um, for, for me, there was, the, the important one was um, this show that was at the Museum of Modern Art in the late 1960s um, called The Machine, as seen at the end of the mechanical, or the, yeah, um, of the mechanical age, um, which, which, you know, looked at, at uh, a broad, a broad, in broad terms this, this time. And in the late 1960s, um, there was definitely a moment, uh, that important moment, where artists were kind of gradually discovering that there is this group of people called engineers that had knowledge and tools that they didn't have, and all of a sudden it became possible to start making things with machines and making complex systems that they couldn't do necessarily by themselves. Um, and so that show, I think, kind of pointed to that moment and historicized it. Um, there's a, there was a show by Harold Zeman in 1975 called the, called the Bachelor Machines, which thought more carefully about this kind of where does the machine end and the body begin, and, and how does one distinguish between those. Um, there was an exhibition just a couple years ago, or 2012, at the New Museum called Ghosts in the Machine, which kind of continued on Harold Zeman, uh, yeah, on the Zeman exhibition. And I, I chose rather, um, I mean, to your point, yes, I, I chose the, to go more towards the, not towards where Zeman and the New Museum went, which was this notion of, you know, what is all, does this have to do with the body? Although the body is absolutely present majorly, and especially a piece by Nairi Bagramian um, as you enter. Um, but more this notion of, 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 of the machine as a particular kind of tool. Mm -hmm. um, and what is it, how is it that we consider these particular tools valuable? You know, what is it, what kind of conditions need to be in place for one to think that this tool is something worth investing time and attention and money to versus this, another tool? Um, and, um, and so if I, I, I kind of went more towards the, the, the machine as a tool, but then therefore, as, it, as that notion of tool has ma manifested itself in the 21st century, um, that the, the, you know, they become a lot more about systems and a lot more about networks and a lot mm -hmm. more about... But I did want, I, I would underline this, and again, I, I'm curious, because I do think there's been what you guys think, because there has been recent years, uh, I remember the, the Berlin Biennial two years ago, mm -hmm. which was curated by this group, Dis Magazine, who, um, I mean, I can't speak about it very much. I don't know them personally at all, but I did see the exhibition. And there was this kind of, and I felt an excitement around, you know, oh, the digital tools. Oh, isn't it great how things can be so flexible and fluid and immaterial and weightless and how in the future everything will be liquid and let's think about what that means. And, and um, you know, I, I guess I... I guess it's worth pointing out on the biographical level that I do live and work in a city where a lot of these tools are invented um, and a lot 
uh, of my friends are losing their apartments and forced to leave that city because of the people inventing these tools. Uh, and so I kind of built in there, there's a kind of skepticism inherent in, in all of this. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not wanting to drink the Kool-Aid about how great of a thing all this flexibility and adaptability is. Um, and um, there's all sorts of questions around labor, obviously, that this brings up. Um, but um, for me, one of, the, one of the lessons that I learned, you know, the way I, small parentheses, the way I really cure, you think about group shows is just learning from artists over the course of many years. And I did an exhibition uh, in 2015 with an artist who's in this show and who's here, Sam Lewitt. And that exhibition really established for me a lot of the vocabulary that I'm using now. And Sam has a beautiful phrase that uh, he used back then, years ago, that have not only stuck, but for me is informed very, in really important ways what I'm trying to work on, which is this, the word he uses to, to thicken. You know, how can we, how can art try to complicate this, you know, effortless weightlessness invisibility of how all things seem to seem, seamlessly move around and how can we kind of tie knots in those networks? How can we make, how can we make that circuitry feel a little more like sludge? How can we kind of pour some sand into that, into those gears to that, to kind of point to the materiality of it, to kind of, to, to, to take all of this cult of efficiency and, and challenge, challenge it, or at least talk about it as a, as a cult. So, mm -hmm. thank you so much for uh, opening up, um, first of all, the historical genealogy um, of minimalism and conceptualism, but also, Anthony, the urgency that you see of dealing with this topic now and the present reception of those genealogies and, and also appropriations. And so just to perhaps create a few more positions or, or constellations, this is a show that you... Uh, this is a reiteration or a new permutation, right? This is a new permutation of a show that opened up in San Francisco. So we have a repetition function which is already part of a kind of machinic, um, machinic thinking in some ways. Um, and in your speaking about it right now, in the last uh, few minutes, you bring up about uh, this uh, notion of the tool, right, that both sh uh, that shapes us, so a kind of biopolitical aspect. Yeah. And you also talk about the ideological aspect of the machine. Uh, not so much so far the kind of state or the na national aspect, although you allude to it with your mm. personal history vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, San Francisco, the nation state, and how it's also implicated in... So we have these three points, right, of the biopolitical, the ideological, and the nation state, but we also have these, um, these genealogies. And unlike the show in Berlin, let's say, this, that basically... Uh, made a proposition of, these, uh, of this kind of techno-fetishism uh, in the present with, with a kind of evacuation of memory, you seem to want uh, to propose some kind of historical, uh, a memory, mm -hmm. a memory trace of those genealogies, as I see it. Perhaps we can also speak about that, how you see, or, or in your choice of artists, and you can again, enter it through Sam Lewitt's work of thickening, if you want, or any other work, mm -hmm. as, of course. Yeah. But how do you see also this as an important aspect, or is it an important aspect for you, to differentiate this proposal from other proposals? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I'm in no way claiming that this is some, like, brand new ideological paradigm or anything. <laughs> um, I'm just kind of continuing the conversation and contributing, you know, one, one you know, twist to it or complication to it. Um, but, uh, yeah. So let's talk about the twist. Let's twist again, like we did last summer. <laughs> the flip. But let's talk about that twist, perhaps. Where, where do you see in the, uh, the works that you yeah. chose a twist or a knot or that kind of operation yeah. that you're alluding to? I mean, you know, there's no, like, digital art in this show, really. I mean, there is maybe a tiny bit, some here and there. But, um, you know, there was a deliberate 
questioning of um, you know this kind of sus or suspicion around the flatness of screens and of images. You know, and I guess that goes back to this notion of thickening, like let's or Sam's notion of thick thickening, I should say. Let's let's you know images you know, today especially circulate so easily and so effortlessly and as we've seen in recent times, you know, um, the ease with which that can happen comes with so much potential for abuse and so much potential for, um, uh, you know. Uh, and so I just wanted to, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, it's mostly, yes, it's mostly kind of a conceptual art show, but it also is, um, a, a material is really Im important to me, you know, even if it's, um, you know, even if Louise Lawler's big piece that everyone has seen, yes, that's a flat image, but that flat image um, is, is been conditioned by and constrained by the physical parameters of the building. Maybe you can open it as well. It's behind you on the left, but don't all get up at once. It's also on the screen. But it's not here. This oh. is only the downstairs one. Okay. But you can all see it. You all saw it. It's a huge, huge colorful image when you turn the corner. Um, and <laughs> um, you know, this notion that, yes, that's photography. That's flat on the wall. And, you know, that looks like a Photoshop thing. That's like a digital process, right? Um, but um, the way that, just to clarify what that image is, Louise Lawler has been making for many decades for using the photo using the machine that is the camera and one of the things that that tool can do is that it can transport one work or well, something from one setting and bring it to another setting via its reproduction and she's been photographing artworks mostly in museums and collections and storage facilities etc and then showing that photograph of that museum in a different museum um, and she's been doing that for a long time but her recent work as which is include new brand new piece for a secession, um, tries to like not allow the image to circulate so easily and tries to say, you know what, this new setting, which is this wall that I've been asked to put something on at secession, that wall has a physical demand. That wall has some constraints that are provided. It's a particular proportion. And therefore, I'm going to allow the physicality of this new setting, you know, the hard wallness of this new setting to force my, to force me to distort my image so that it is adjusted so that it fits the scale and proportion of this wall. Even if digital technology could easily have her enlarge it in however way she wanted and have it be perfectly the perfect photograph that she took originally, she's saying no, you know, the wall is asking that this image be stretched and, 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 and adjusted so that it fits a physical the physical conditions of a, of a room. So I guess this idea of, of, um, of yeah, of, of the stuff of it all, the stu stuff behind it all, not just the software behind it all, um, is something that I feel is, is, um, is significant. I wonder if that kind of comes through or whether it, because there are so many flat images work in the show, whether it feels to you like it is a, that images are yeah, I would like to uh, continue when you're talking about Louis Lawler because I think um, uh, you made up a very interesting constellation with um, this main uh, room with Louis Lawler on one hand, Lutz Bakker and Harun Farocki, for instance, and we can really see um, uh, some uh, very uh, central uh, points of discussion you are opening, and. Um, as um, uh, Sylvie uh, Sabat already mentioned, Sylvie asks us to um, talk yep. about our tours. So, uh, of course, um, this is a very special moment, uh, only a few minutes or uh, before the opening, before the public comes into it, so a lot of people are already here. So I think um, this exhibition is also about the responsibility um, you, as a, you have, you as a curator, you as an institution, we as a public, um, 
in talking about bringing up uh, things and talking about mechanisms uh, in uh, as a concerning this uh, big big uh, monstrum of a machine as you maybe also build it up so we can refer to it maybe later um, so but I think this is an interesting so we are involved in, in, in uh, into this process and I think it's interesting to ask where are these relations how can we read them um, how can um, how can we mediate them how can we communicate them um, so um, what you did Sabat uh, referred to it uh, uh, to, to the soul to the soluid piece um, is, um, I think, the interesting opposite opposition of uh, Lutz Bakker with the grids, the school boards, uh, the blackboards, uh, you know, all the instruments we have in uh. school of uh, discipline, okay. controlling, and um, uh, and uh, and these, these questions are very linked close together with the questions of functioning, functioning in a timetable, uh, exactly, all, all these kind of aspects. What I think is super interesting is that it's also a kind of um, uh, we, it's an it's an index of abstraction, of course, yeah. And um, abstraction uh, as mechanism uh, is uh, we are very confident with abstraction as an artistic strategy, um, and so. I think we also should ask what does abstraction, what is abstraction doing um, in referring, uh, bringing up mechanisms or working as a machine? Um, so um, my students probably know, so I'm, I'm talking it again and again about it, uh, because I'm, uh, I think it's um, very interesting that there is uh, Norman Brosterman, an American art historian, and, and he uh, was um, referring to this uh, development of abstraction from a completely different point of view. Uh, so it's not, um, he's not so much talking about autonomy, but he's talking about um, the abstraction as an industrial process, as a, it's a process of mechanization. Um, that um, um, Fröbel is a teacher in the mid of the 19th century, he invented um, uh, so-called gifts to train pupils, uh, to uh, train them to think in an abstract way. And what he wanted to do, he wanted to bring them in factories because they were living on the streets and had, they didn't have education, so they were trained to fit in the industrial um, mechanical process. So what's very interesting, what you, do, you, what you also did is uh, that uh, in the opposite of Lutz Packer, uh, you, the, you, there is this Harun Farocki piece um, uh, where he's talking about um, the, yeah, the monstrum of war and, uh, and he has to, he's trained by a psychotherapist uh, to, re, to, uh, to recall uh, his, uh, his memories of war. And um, what, uh, what's um, getting clear with this opposition, which is, I think is really interesting, has, it has a lot to do with, with each other, uh, because this training um, in certain mechanism, um, uh, it was um, uh, Klaus Piers, as a media theorist, he also referred to it, that um, uh, the, the, the Fröbel, the reform pedagogic, as we call it, reform pedagogic, that these um, uh, uh, trainings were important also for army tests, also for the mental army tests, so that um, you have to prove that you are able to be alert, uh, that you have to prove what's your reaction, as mm -hmm. how fast can you think or um, react, shoot at the end. Mm -hmm. So this has a lot to do with each other. So um, what I want to mm -hmm. say is that the artistic strategies uh, or um, Educational strategies or uh, strategies of order. Yeah, we have. It's also a question of order as mechanism. Um, uh, what we can see here, like in, in the grid, and uh, this question of order is also when, when we see the at the work of Naira um, Bagrami and at the entrance. It's also a question of discipline and order and and the right uh, form. And so I think um, we have to talk about. These um, these relations um, which uh, came uh, mm -hmm. yeah which are f you're forming or which are coming up maybe to stop here. <laughs> well, so perhaps the question would be mm -hmm. um, given that we're trying mm -hmm. to establish uh, certain tools through which to read the exhibition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What how should let's say the the, the viewer 
create those relations? Is it, what are the tools that one needs to make those creations between dif different forms of abstraction, yeah. also that, that, that operate at different disciplinary levels? Mm -hmm. How would one read that also using different forms, right? We have different f uh, forms and different t to communicate those abstractions. Yeah. So how would you hope that the people roaming through the space tonight make those uh, connections? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a question one can ask with any single exhibition, you know? Um, and, um, you know, there's definitely, b there's a lot of relationships that try to establish on a formal level, also in addition to a, a kind of content based around 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 works, and that I just can, you know, my job is to kind of set something in place and provide the tools that you know we wrote these extended captions that give some information to all of the audience to be able to read a bit, they have a bit more context, but then you know, the, the hoping that the adjacency somehow makes it so that that, that both works, or, you know, or that works kind of complicate each other and, and, um, and that those adjacencies might add up to larger than the sum of their parts. And I guess that's how one would hopefully to describe um, any exhibition. You know, here, um, um, it's interesting, I hadn't thought necessarily about the Lutzbacher and the Faroki in the way that you're mm -hmm. describing. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's a, but I completely, I completely, um, this notion of order, I mean, yeah, machines, right? And machines basically in a fundamental way are in the problem solving business. You know, they're in the, they're in the, the create order business or to, to some degree. And, you know, I guess I personally would not necessarily describe art in those terms, in, uh, in it, art being in the problem-solving business, which is what, for me, makes this such an interesting tension between these two topics, you know. Um, but order, this question of, like, how do we situate ourselves around the demands for problems to be solved and, and what art and how abst abstraction can try to speak to you know, what is abstraction solving in, in, in that context? And, and what is it about our demand that it should solve something? Um, and, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier this, this thing around efficiency or that word, which is, for me, has been a really important one. And as all of the artists in this show know, because I've talked about it for the past three years with them. Um, and um, I'm just interested in... in, in that word because, um, first of all, because I think this kind of mantra of efficiency or this notion that that should be the virtue or that should be a, a, the desired goal that, our, that machines should try to reach um, is something that's interesting when put in contrast with, with an artwork because I guess I don't necessarily immediately consider an artwork to be a super efficient language yeah and i think there's another follow up question ah, yeah. to, uh, would you like to yeah and i just to want to uh, to not maybe correct but i uh, i was not talking about solving uh, that art is solving problems yeah, no. but um, what i'm interested in is uh, the role it plays yeah uh, she's not sh suggesting something uh, but she plays a certain role in taking over appropriating strategies you which are meant yeah. for other things yeah? yeah so this is maybe the the, the point i was going for Mm -hmm. No, I just uh, wanted to ask the, uh, add a very simple question in how far you uh, translate all your concepts related to the art objects like uh, tools or non-efficient tools. I like this concept of thickness and so on. In how far you translate it into the concept of the exhibition space, yeah. Yeah? in terms of navigation, in terms of taxonomy, yeah. since those aspects and strategies are so relevant, for example, for Harun Faroki's work, yeah? uh, my question would be in how far you translate where it into the spatial the concept. Yeah? yeah, where is it in the room? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I wrote this essay for the first book that talks about a little bit of the historical, at least for me, work that I did thinking through this, but I very deliberately did not, you know, I don't do the thing where it's like this and this is the case and this theory is this, you know, for example, comma, 
Aaron Flint Jameson, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I, I never, I just have a hard time, you know, framing an exhibition exactly in those terms. You know, I'll, I'll, what I can do is provide some general introductory language, like the press release I wrote for this show, and then the descriptions of the, of the individual works. Um, and um, how each of the, those individual works kind of speak to the, the kind of general concept or the introductory remarks is, I mean, for me, the point of why you go see exhibitions is to kind of like, is to find oneself. I don't, you know, I, it might make sense in one way in my head, but I, 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 I'm, I'm hoping the three of you, it makes sense in a different way. But, and I don't say that just in this kind of like open-ended is good and cultural relativism stuff. Um, I just do think that that's what can, exhibitions can do well, you know, is not, you know, provide a series of illustrations of someone's way of seeing the world, but that someone's particular, you know, someone can provide some language that can frame a kind of thematic territory that can then be populated by a range of positions that kind of bump into each other in ways that belong in that territory enough so that they could bump into each other, even physically and visually, um, but exactly the terms upon which they do and what they might do to each other is something that, you know, in terms of exhibition making, which is maybe different than writing and book, you know, I think needs to be left untouched. Did you have a follow-up question, Sabit, or? Mm -hmm. No. No, okay. So, um, so what you're saying, as far as I understand, is that you're setting up a kind of constellation, a discursive field that also includes the catalog, yeah. um, the previous catalog, as well as this catalog. And in that catalog, you actually try to make a differentiation between three different types of machines. Uh, the useless machine, the broken machine, and the inefficient machine. And the machine that you try to bring into the space uh, as a kind of paradigmatic model, let's say, or paradigmatic proposition of how we might counter uh, what you kind of call the fluidity of, of today's digital space or digital production yeah. or um, is the is the inefficient machine. Yeah. Uh, perhaps you can uh, that. open yeah. that up to the, to the audience, to the public. Yeah. I, I can just, just to, to, to pick up on that, but then I really would love to hear what you guys think about those three types, mm -hmm. because I'm just still, I say it out loud, and I'm still unsure exactly what those three things, why this, all I can say is what I'm struck with between a broken machine and a useless machine and an inefficient machine, um, the notion of the broken, you know, is the, you know, the like, the punk position, I guess, like, break, break it all, throw a machete into the gears of the mechanism and have it stop working, and isn't that so radical and subversive? And I think most of us will agree that there's not all that much subversion there, considering those kinds of moves are being done by, you know, urban outfitters selling ripped jeans or whatever it might be. Um, and um, um, the notion of the useless machine um, is, is one that, you know, appears, art, you know, historically in, in the 60s or 70s, artists like Jean Tingley explicitly talking about wanting to make useless machines, machines that work but that don't have a purpose uh, for working uh, and how that might be a subversion of the a critique of technology. I mean, all of this comes under the broad rubric of critique of technology, I guess is worth mm -hmm. saying, right? And so a, bro a, a, a useless machine can kind of critique this notion that, oh, why is technology always put in the name of u use? You know, what would it mean to use the tools of technology but have it go towards a useless purpose? And that feels, again, that feels like something that's been rehearsed and rehearsed in art in, in general. And for me, for me, the inefficient machine is kind of an intriguing notion because an inefficient machine is not broken. It's continuing to work and doing what it's meant to do and was designed to do. It's not useless. It has a purpose that it's trying to work towards. Um, but it's, reach, it's, 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 it's headed towards achieving its task and fulfilling its purpose, you know, using a, you know, without prioritizing a value system like let's save time or let's have it cost less money or let's take the shortest way from point A to point P. Like these assumptions that we make about 
how we should achieve tasks, how, what is the, 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 the easiest, you know, cheapest, quickest. Um, and um, what would it mean to try to think about, um, I think, an, you know, maybe art, art somewhere belong. I don't know, I, I'm just curious what you think, somewhere art might be in there as something that tries to communicate something to the world, but maybe not according to those, not by trying to go from point A to point B the fastest, not by doing it the cheapest way, not by, not by solving all the problems, but by kind of navigating the problem, you know, and adding problems, adding detours, adding dead ends, and doing things that, again, still are working towards saying something. It's not just a useless, purposeless function, but it, it's, it's doing so by not embracing the kind of ideological regime of, of the machine, which is accomplish quick, fast, efficiently, period. Yeah. Please, no, no. yeah. Um, on the one hand, uh, I very much like uh, these uh, three types or your distinction between the three types of machines. And uh, since you already uh, mentioned, they are very typical for some kind of modern or classical ideas of the machine. And I'm wondering whether it's a bit romantic or yeah. nostalgic. I was thinking through for example, the purposeless machine uh, that very much was uh, attached by Rosalind Krauss to solo it. So let's take him again, you know, the uh, repetition that doesn't lead to a certain goal, yeah, and mm -hmm. that empties itself and so on and so on. And that stresses much more the irrational side right. than the rational side. And Looking at nowadays conditions, I don't, I wouldn't know whether I would still embrace so much the irrational. Looking at the politics, right-wing politics, that's very much counting on the irrational. And I think probably we have to reconsider this kind of very, you know, uh, familiar and, uh, yeah, uh, uh, tradition of embracing the irrational as the other of yeah. capitalism. And so... That's a great... I wonder what, if you guys could respond to that, because that's... Um, yeah. I, what I think um, you're referring to this moment of irrational, I think it's interesting when you look at the uh, Louis Lawler piece, uh, because uh, what she did is... Uh, this work uh, was taken at the Art Institute in uh, Chicago, and uh, we can see an Art Schwager piece and an Agnes Martin piece. And um, uh, Anthony also, he told us what she did uh, in uh, 2016 when Trump was elected. Uh, she, what she did, she made a twist. So she, like, uh, twisted the... Um, the machine so far. So what we have is kind of this um, very moving, colorful image, which is um, very much the opposite of the grid and order system, what mm -hmm. we have in Lutz Bacher's piece. Yeah? Uh, so, and I think um, we were talking about this yesterday. I think it frightens me also a little bit because um, mm -hmm. this is a kind of a strategy of uh, embracing the irrational also, or uh, embracing the unclear, mm -hmm. or embracing the open things, we don't know how they end, uh, so it's completely, it's not the controlling system as we mm. have it here. Um, so this is um, uh, maybe also um, a moment um, um, of a machine uh, where we do have the feeling we can't control it anymore. So uh, this is what maybe you are criticizing when Anthony is talking yeah. about the machine as a, as a monster where you want to bring some sand into, yeah. the, into the gears. So that it stops a little bit or is irritated. So, um, but I think um, um, you also um, are quoting Donna Haraway in the catalog uh, where she is saying artworks struggle against perfect communication. So, uh, so we want to do against something. But isn't this, t no, I think it's not enough. Yeah, uh, t uh, just to say um, we have uh, yeah. to, to put some sand in there. So yeah. isn't, um, um, aren't we confronted with strategies uh, where we say, okay, you know, yeah. um, where is it going? Yeah. Um, yeah. I actually think that some of the works 
some of the works exceed the typology that you just suggested, which I think is exciting. Because the, the typology, I would agree with Sabbath that the typology of the useless, the broken, and the inefficient is very much a kind of modernist uh, model. We can talk about the welfare state as broken, inefficient. Uh, we can talk about where yeah. democracy is now. Um, and we can talk about um, uh, ri the new models of, of the state, the racial state, right? The racist state. Um, and where that leaves us today in terms of thinking of new typologies of political subjects. And the, one, the, wor the work that really speaks to me is the one by Pope L. Uh, yeah. Perhaps because, um, I'm, well, I'm a fan. I'll just put it out there. <laughs> I'm a fan, but I also think that his work um, uh, doesn't perform a gesture that, uh, that w whose content and form are so easily already coded uh, and, uh, and can be commodified easily and then re-performed yeah. to a kind of emptiness. I mean, In I think this is a good, sorry. Yeah, so I think he's perhaps moving beyond, uh, through so many registers of class, race, yeah. gender. Maybe you say um, yeah. because people don't know. No. Yeah. In contemporary conditions of neo uh, liberal global capitalism, mm -hmm. that his work actually proposes the way we might want to think about, about uh, new categories. So, yeah, I, yeah, I think I, the work in that way exceeds the typology. That's. that's great to hear because I mean I do I, I and I do agree that this piece is not you know on board with this notion of like the irrational as the other of late capitalism it's mm -hmm. it's it's more complicated or it's just it's it's operating a little bit differently just to give a little bit of background to mm -hmm. this piece which is directly behind everyone hung high on that wall um, you can't see it yeah <laughs> It's evading capture. Yeah, it's a, it's a, for me this actually, it's, it's a work that in, in trying to talk to people about the show has turned into a really, really useful piece to be, that gets at what the, some of the general intentions in a really general sense this show in gen, is trying to do. Um, so this is, um, you can't even maybe see it in the photograph at all. I'll just say it's a, it's a, it's a water fountain, like a drinking fountain. Um, that is installed on the wall that's been turned sideways, obviously. And if you walk up closer, you'll recognize the kind of hardware that makes it a, a water fountain. And for me, this is a great, it's a great piece for this context, well, in general, but also for this context because it, it incorporates these, this notion of a mechanism in these two different ways. So on one hand, on the mechanism of, uh, as, a, as a kind of mechanical object, this is a water delivery machine. That's what a water fountain is. You push a button and water is delivered to you. The mechanical process ha makes that happen. Okay. Um, this particular water fountain, however, was acquired by Popel um, and it dates from the 1950s. Um, and, and Popel is an American artist in, from Chicago and um, in the American cultural or political imagination the words 1950s and water fountain already mean a lot. And I, I, I presume, I suspect that might be a little bit different in Europe. So 1950s, pre-civil rights America. Um, pre-civil rights, there's a range of different tools used by um, the culture to separate people based on the color of their skin. You know, I'm sure most of you recognize the images of the bathrooms where it's the white entrance and the colored entrance. Um, but one of the most dominant things that again exists so well in photography is the water fountain. There's the white co-watered fountain and the, the water fountain with the sign that says colored above it. So this, in this sense it's a, it's a water delivery machine, but it also is a segregation machine. You know, it's a tool available to those who want to separate a population based on their skin color. You know, so this notion that mechanism is both a device as well as an ideolo as well as an ideology, and it somehow incorporates both of those things. So yeah, it's not it's not kind of signing up to you know long live the irrational in that in the way that you were 
Mm -hmm. And what I also like about that particular work is that it already responds to the capture of thickness by the state in the sense that we ca I, I, don't f I personally don't think that we can just create a binary of fluidity and thickness, right? Fluidity is the kind of digital uh, standardization efficiency uh, systems and thickness being this kind of glitch, this sand in the machine. The state itself is capturing bodies, turning them into dead bodies, you know, yeah. uh, biopolitical engineering into dead bodies at the border, etc., or racialized bodies. So I, what I like about that work is that it also responds to that aspect of the machine. Yeah. In, uh, yeah. in the way that the state already has captured that. that aspect that too. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's my, yeah. my continuation <laughs> of, of how I would analyze or how I would enter or how I would make sense of the works that for me uh, exceed this typology, where I can see an artwork proposing a different way of thinking that somehow uh, opens up new spaces for, for political um, subjectivity. I don't know if any of you also see that, uh, a work that somehow exceeds this typology or that proposes something other than what the curator may have uh, uh, intended <laughs> or thought. I think that's always interesting. There is uh, another aspect I would like to uh, mention, probably it uh, can add some uh, uh, thoughts to, to your considerations, and that is um, uh, the art business as mechanism. And since all works reflect, of course, in a very sophisticated way about uh, uh, social control or self-control, you mention also the dialectics between evaluation, self-evaluation, qualification, all those aspects that nowadays governs our subjectivity. And therefore, I uh, find one work I didn't know, and which was for me a kind of really nice discovery, is Howard Fried's <laughs> film installation. Probably we can show it, it is in the basement. It's inside the Harlequin <coughs> Approach Avoidance 3 and 2 from 1971. And I didn't know about Sorry, him, yeah. I have to uh, uh, admit. And uh, for me, it was so interesting that uh, this work very much resembles Bruce Nauman's studio uh, films from 1968. And since you were addressing the fact that there uh, is a history of the artwork to rehearse the conditions of the mechanism of the machine again and again. We see a scene in the studio where the artist is uh, kind of, um, yeah, commanding his assistants, yeah, by giving them tasks and like ridiculous uh, tasks and the artist himself appears very clownish and ridiculous himself, but by saying or by invoking that uh, there is a kind of repetitive activity being performed in the studio that is leading to nothing, and that is about the empty studio. And we mm -hmm. can see how the ontology of the studio or the spatial ontology is being transformed into the temporal ontology in th of the mechanical image, the way how the camera is turned around, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. Probably yeah. you can add some ideas. I can to add some. I mean, Howard Fried is an artist that's not known to many people, not just here, but even in the United States. Um, and that work is from 1971. Um, it's, there's no picture here, but it's, it's the first piece you see when you go downstairs. And yeah, just to give a bit of context, essentially he's, um, again, place it historically, 1971, you know, so this is definitely part of the beginnings of artists thinking about systems and thinking about devising rules and, and constraints, you know, around which uh, to, gen you know, how can constraints be productive. Um, and um, he, so he considers the, the, the physical space of the studio 
um, uh, as the place of making, but also as a place of decision making. Mm -hmm. um, and for him, decision making and how decision making works is, is the topic of most of his work. He's obsessed with this one behavioral um, um, typology that psychologists use to describe particular kind of behavior. There's they d some some schools of psychologists divide behavior in these in this matrix of avoid, avoid, approach, approach, and approach avoidance. And Howard is thinks that art is all and his work is all about approach avoidance, which very simply means you know the type of person, whether it's an artist or not, who the closer he or she gets to their goal, the more and more allergic they are to that goal, basically. And that's just like a, a way some people are wired, and Howard is absolutely wired that way. Um, and so he puts that in action, um, and so for him, being in the studio is this kind of almost, not traumatic is much too strong of a word, but a, you know, a difficult place of, of trying to be faced with decisions that he like knows he needs to make but can't make. Um, and so this piece is, he asked two other people to, he's, he paints the floor of his studio, one half in gray, one half in white, and separates two people who are given the instruction to not be allowed to cross the line, and then he gives them a series of problems to solve or decisions to make um, and, and tasks to complete. So move this period of this stuff of, from this side to this side, you know, build this thing in this way, move, you know, un destroy this thing in this way, you know, climb from this floor to that floor without touching the ground. And so these two people are trying to achieve these tasks. And Howard is the only one who's allowed to walk back and forth between both. And his role is the kind of problem maker. He's the antagonist figure. They're busy trying to solve all these problems and complete all these tasks. And he, as they're trying to climb on the wall in this gymnastic way from one side to the other without touching the floor, because he's asked him to, he's going to then insert himself halfway on the wall and add an obstacle in their way. He's constantly trying to get in their way and make their problem solving more difficult. Um, he's trying to mm -hmm. thicken it up, mm -hmm. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think this, uh, this work of Howard Reed is a very good example also for, uh, you can also think about law as a mechanism uh, because uh, so uh, the figure has certain rules, as you mentioned, that he's allowed to uh, step across the border and the other figure isn't. Uh, yep. so, uh, so this uh, is a very uh, interesting play. So the one is going back and forth and the other yep. has to stop all, all the time. Yep. Uh, so it's also about functioning um, uh, after a law, after rule, you yeah. know, um, and also this uh, can be, um, um, yeah, as, you, as, as, as this mechanism, as you mentioned it. What, uh, another work I would like to mention in this context is uh, from Cameron Rowland. Um, the work uh, you can also find it uh, in, um, uh, in, yeah, uh, about uh, the insurance. Uh, company of uh, Generali, which is, I think, very interesting because it also makes up a more wide, as it widens the context. It's not only that um, that insurance is uh, kind of a mechanism, um, as we know that uh, it is about theft and um, making money out of thefts. Um, uh, you have a Lazzarato text also in the catalog which is referring to this uh, question. Um, but um, what another, uh, another aspect uh, which is bringing up is uh, that uh, aspect of exploita uh, exploitation. Um, uh, the, the history is also referring to the Belgium um, um, company of Generali, uh, which was uh, founded in 1901 and which is very, uh, very much connected to the Congo um, uh, business, uh, which was uh, done in, by the beginning of end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century. So this um, aspect of exploitation um, is, I think, very interesting because um, also um, uh, you have an essay um, uh, in the catalog where you're referring to this uh, question of exploitation. Marx is uh, referring to it uh, that uh, a machine is uh, trying uh, to uh, to 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 giving us so to in producing a surplus value, uh, it tries to to maximize uh, the exploitation. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is maybe something you're 
referring to when you, um, uh, in, the, in the beginning, in, in your statement, you were referring to the economy system um, in, in New York, uh, that uh, uh, the li life is not, um, you know, people have a lot of problems um, in you know, uh, living their life. Uh, so economy is um, so-called um, uh, uh, like a monster machine. Um, and, uh, and at the same time you say, so nobody can stop the machine. So we are like uh, standing here and looking at the machine and they're waiting. So when is the crash coming or something yeah. like that? So uh, isn't this a kind of, um, uh, so where the modernist con concept of the machine is, um, um, yeah, is standing in front of, as a uh, opposite uh, to this uh, contemporary, uh, maybe software uh, understanding of machine, uh, can we still um, react uh, to the to the machine? And um, as we said, um, putting some sand in the yep. in the gears, or do we have um, do we need other other strategies? Uh? There's a work by Cameron Rowland that is the perfect answer to that question. That very sadly is. Um, I mean, the works in here, I think, speak to it in a in, in less direct way, but absolutely, I'm glad you, you, that you got that from, from those works. There was another work that we, were, that we showed in another, the other version of this show, which is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art, and we couldn't mm -hmm. borrow it again, um, which I'll just, maybe it's worth talking a, a little bit about. Um, visually, it looks pretty much exactly to this piece anyway. Um, it's just a, a legal document. Um, but it, it talks about not only money, but how do we understand that, yes, we can't stop the mechanisms of legal mechanisms, economic mechanisms, law, legal mechanisms. How do, we, how do we make problems for it? And how can art um, kind of insert some kind of, um, you know, dead end and wor working with it within its gears and working within how it, how it works? How can art kind of set traps? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to use a literal word of traps that are in the show. Um, so the work um, starts uh, with um, this notion which relates to the insurance that, that Cameron became very interested in the notion that um, slaves, during slavery, and at least in the US, but in Generali's case in Europe, um, um, slave owners could buy insurance to cover their slaves. So, in other words, insurance companies were making money off of slaves, essentially. Um, and so Cameron, on one hand, is interested in the history of insurance companies mm -hmm. in that regard mm -hmm. and, and their history of insuring mm -hmm. shipments of human mm -hmm. beings across mm -hmm. oceans and how what insurance companies have to do with that and the money they made from mm -hmm. that. Um, the piece that, called Disgorgement, the other work that's not here, but it's worth bringing up, um, um, so on one hand, there is, there is um, that, and, and he was researching a, a, an American insurance company that still exists today that had that policy back in the 1860s. And Aetna is the, in the American piece, not, it was, instead of Generali, it was Aetna, which is a company that still is a big insurance company. Um, and... Um, then the other departure point for the other piece was that um, every year since 1989, um, one U.S. member of Congress, a man named John Conyers, who um, is no longer in Congress now, but for many years he was, and every single January he would propose the same exact bill a year after year after year after year. Um, and it was called the U uh, Reparations Act. And if the U.S. Congress would ever pass this bill, um, what they would be doing was they would be, um, it, would, it was a bill that established not only a formal apology from the United States government for, to the descendants of slaves, but also a, a, a reparations bill. So it would figure out, the American government would commit to coming up with a way to measure and how to distribute reparation payments to the descendants of slaves. So, uh, what did Cameron do? Cameron did two things. He first took $10,000 of an exhibition budget, which was the big part of his budget for a show he did in New York, and he bought 100 shares of Aetna stock. Mm -hmm. um, that's how much $10,000 could buy him. So he owned part of Aetna. So he owned part of the company that in some way was, you know, um, 
profited from, from all this. And then the piece that was on the wall was called a trust, uh, was the legal document that then in the name of, in this notion of tools, Cameron, in the, no, in the context of today, we live in a time when there's all sorts of financial tools that people are inventing. You know, Wall Street is busy trying to come up with different mechanisms it can do where it can credit default swaps and, and all kinds of tricks of how to bet money, you know, buy uh, port, you know, risk on product rather than product itself. So he, um, he invented his own financial tool, which is a trust. So a trust is a particular kind of financial tool that some of you might be familiar with. A trust is, you know, your parents make a trust and they put money into it, but that trust's conditions is that it can own, that money can only be made available according to certain conditions, usually like when you turn 18 or when you turn 60 or whatever the conditions that someone wants to set. So Cameron made a trust and so it's a lockbox for money that can only be unlocked when something specific happens. So Cameron made a trust and in, locked inside of that trust are the hundred shares of Aetna stock. And the only thing that would unlock the trust is the U.S. government passing this bill. So this is working within the, mechan within the machinery, that, you know, not asking that the machine stops, actually it had demanding that it continue to work, right? It's not breaking the machine, but it's just kind of making a, me you know, it's kind of turning it into itself, onto itself. So, you know, in the extraordinarily unlikely situation that the U.S. government would ever, you know, if, the way U.S. Congress works is that someone can propose a bill all they want, but until they get enough what's called co-signers to sign on to this bill, it won't even get debated on the floor of Parliament, of Congress. And the John Conyers bill, you know, one, 1980, in the early 90s, they would have like two other senators that would sign on, and then that, a couple years, there was maybe like 12 or whatever, and then none. And it wouldn't, you know, it needs like, I don't know, I don't know how many is the minimum, but dozens before it would even get considered to even to be discussed uh, by Congress. So, yeah. Anthony, thank you for that. It's actually super important and timely given what's happening right now all over the world with uh, the racialization of the state and uh, the use of capital to uh, dispossess already dispossessed people that we have this work here, yeah. not only in the American context, but also in the local context. Yeah. Given, we have now about five minutes. Okay. So given what we've just heard um, for the last hour and a half or so, I would like to invite my fellow uh, panel members to maybe ask uh, one or two questions almost rhetorically that you would now <laughs> basically pose as follow-up questions for the next segment of the conversation should we have uh, the possibility to continue it. Basically, put out, put out some questions into the public sphere. Yeah, uh, what a nice task. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the taskmaster tonight. Now, I, listening to your very sophisticated answer, um, I was thinking about especially a feminist legacy in dealing with technology and what um, mechanics mean to the reproduction of life or the reproduction of art within the reproduction of life. And I was thinking about how to address the fact, and you said that, that uh, those artists and art uh, are part of the mechanisms, yeah? They're not outside, but they are part. And how to address this kind of collective libido or the, the, the libidinous energies, yeah? Which is being recreated, reproduced by art itself with the promise that that would be a side for a kind of different or other mechanisms that was very much questioned by feminist artists like Dara Birnbaum, Mary Kelly, um, and uh, Yvonne Reyna, name it, I just named the most famous ones, by saying that is already incorporated yeah, and embodied in our social relations, be it in our sexual relations and the reproduction uh, children, care, etc., pp. That was just an idea that popped up in 
in order to also get an idea why this kind of critical artworks always look so good. And <laughs> at least, and uh, what kind of libido, yeah, as part of this machinery you have just described so yeah. sophistically, uh, what does that mean, whether we repeat again and again, you know, this kind of, of mechanism you just described? Eva Maria, what is your last question? Um, yeah, I was, um, a short time ago, I was uh, doing some research on this um, questions, um, uh, I'm not a robot, you know this function, it's a public Turing yes. test, where you have to prove that you're not a robot, and um, when I did some research, I found out uh, that the computer already knows if you're a robot or not, before you <laughs> set your mark, you know, uh, because he's calculating how long, how much time you need to answer this question, and how, what's your IP address, blah, blah, blah. So, he knows it already. So, um, what I think what I would suggest is um, uh, to, to, to question these mechanisms we, as uh, Sabet um, also said, we are involved in. And I would go, I would like to be able to answer these questions with, um, I'm not a robot. <laughs> and my last question, Anthony, would be given that we're thinking about surplus value, also a social capital, and we have so much social capital circulating in these works. Uh, you mentioned also the way that Cameron Rowland put the surplus value of that work towards a, a purpose. I'm wondering um, how we can think of a different model, a future model of a kind of political subjectivity in which surplus value plays a different role. And and you have no time to answer any of those questions. No, no, but I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask two, two really short questions. Yeah. My last two questions for everyone would be, you know, it, you know, what, in the context of art, what is the other of capitalism? That's a big question. I don't know. And then the last question, of course, is did Columbia win? <laughs> they did? <laughs> All right. Thank you. So yeah. I would like to thank yeah. everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah. Thank you.